camera. I am really grateful that we have been able in this pandemic period to launch the YouTube channel of the Karen video message from Tap on Sundays. That's because we do have an alumni audience that misses coming to be with you. And so good morning to those of you who are watching on uh, the internet, this broadcast. It is the 20th of December, the fourth Sunday of Advent. I have my silly Christmas hat on. Uh, but I want to talk about serious things, so I'm going to pull that off for the moment. Also, my forehead's getting warm. And um, I want to especially sort of just acknowledge that this time in life can be difficult. And I was just thinking about also we're using the screen, so that, that's where we're going to go. This is next thing. So, Where to start? Being in treatment. Fun, right? Yay! Sorry. I'm not, I'm not really making fun of you. I, I think it's very, very important to acknowledge that uh, this probably wasn't your holiday plan. And um, I have empathy for you for that. And I realize that we are in a period of time in 2020 where many people, even those not in this setting, will be intentionally distancing themselves from others out of love. So uh, that's, a, that's a powerful, like maybe comfort, is that there are lots of people who won't get to be doing their customary holiday gatherings or didn't get to do them for Hanukkah because of COVID concerns. Um, but uh, um, so maybe there's solidarity that you could feel as a patient here uh, with people out there in the world who are also really struggling, folks in hospitals who don't get to be visited. And, um, and yet, that doesn't take away the difficulty. So uh, being in treatment is um, uh, a challenge because of the feeling of loss of the customary ways in which you might celebrate the holidays. I know for me, previous to my recovery, the period from Thanksgiving to New Year's was sort of one big uh, buzz fest. And um, I, uh, I thought it gave me extra license to be even more intoxicated, and I expected people to be even more generous and reckless. And I was the same. And um, I thought I was going to miss that terribly. My first year of sobriety, as I entered the Thanksgiving into Christmas period, I was like, oh, this is going to be awful. And I will tell you, I had, I had to just kind of white knuckle it through many, many holiday years in my recovery. So I always can say if the very best thing I can do is make it to January 2nd and not have picked up, like that's a victory. And I don't have to be happy. I don't have to be ecstatic. I don't have to like find the Christmas joy. I don't have to, you know, um, uh, be elf on the shelf. I don't, I don't have to... Uh, manifest something that is inauthentic, and um, I just need to get through. And uh, those of us who live in the northern hemisphere have, uh, I think, the the dominance of the northern hemisphere in global culture has caused the winter festival seasons of the major wisdom traditions to coincide with winter. Because, of course, if you were in South America, um, it would be summertime at home, right? But it's wintertime. So in the middle of the doldrums of pandemic, and in the middle of the doldrums of being in treatment, and in the middle of the doldrums of whatever else is um, your particular challenge set, we all are like dealing with sunset at 4.30, and uh, very, very limited amounts of daylight. And suddenly a foot of snow and plummeting temperatures, which, which is the natural order of things. Um, but uh, for some reason, in the last two years, we haven't seen snow here hardly at all. So it's really a bit of a shock to those of us who have spent a lot of time in these parts. And, and so I think the, the, that triggers a kind of a hibernation response in me. I don't know if you feel like um, you want nuts and hot chocolate and the other one underneath a blanket, but uh, much less, like, so I have to exert extra effort to get myself to go exercise or do all those kinds of things because it's a, um, I, I try to be judicious in my use of the word, it's a depressing time of year. It's a, 
uh, that they call it seasonal affective disorder, right? Sad. And uh, that's a very, very real thing as well. So I'm not starting chapel on a cheery note. No, I'm intentionally not starting chapel on a cheery note because I'm headed in a direction that I want to sort of be ultimately rejected. But I believe that it's really important for us to honor the difficulties that we have when we're having them. And that especially those of us who suffer from use disorders have often used to avoid the truth of our pain. And so, um, and I was just as much that, and still can be. I, I, I tell people I don't eat cookies, I do cookies. And um, uh, when I'm baking, that's usually a sign that I'm trying to uh, avoid something. Uh, and um, even when I'm going down the cookie aisle in the grocery store, I, there's a little inner voice in me that's like, hmm, what's wrong in your soul, Jack? And this is... This time of year, there is this unbelievable tension between the expectations that are laid on us by holidays and by society to be festive and celebratory and the realities that we face. And I think in this year, and for you in this circumstance, especially so. So if anybody's in a bah humbug mood, I totally get it, and I'm happy to have you be here, and be as bah humbug as you need. And I wanted to share a very important teaching moment for me about winter, and the for me, my Christian tradition, the Advent Christmas cycle, and uh, for those of us who are in other wisdom traditions, there are no wisdom tradition that we think of at all as our own. The, the, the Northern Hemisphere's climatological dynamics can still cause us to think and feel about these movements, and the world is in such a dark place. Anyway, I was thinking about what it would have been a year. It would have been 1997. And uh, yes, I was a much younger man at that time. And I had a dear friend, I was in seminary in Washington, D.C. And I had a dear friend, we were kind of an odd match, but um, she was a brave and courageous seminarian who had decided to locate herself in, um, to think about the quadrant, Northeast DC in a very, very difficult kind of a neighborhood. Um, as part of her, she was almost living like these monastic, a monastic women to live in the context of people suffering. And um, I was interested in that, uh, those decisions that she had made to not live on the dorm campus in the relative privilege and comfort that we were in in Northwest DC, but instead to pick a really tough neighborhood. And um, so I was going to spend the day with her and kind of see what her world was like. And she took me first to um, stop in at the place where she had also gotten a part-time job, which was at the time the nation's largest in-city homeless shelter, uh, right near the Capitol in, in D.C. Kind of a blatant, grim neighborhood. But uh, I, was, I was curious about was going there, and uh, she sure did not look the part of a person who would be hanging out in that particular environment. But I think that's, that reflects my own prejudices and stereotypes. Anyway, I'm with her, her name happened to be Faith. And I'm with Faith, I'm down there in D.C., it's 1997. I've got Christmas stuff on the mind. And uh, she said, I just need to go in and pick up my check or whatever. And so we go in and there's a, there's like a glass security desk and you have to be buzzed in if you're, if you're in the know. And she said, can I just leave you here in the lobby? I'm just going to run and I'll be right back out. And I said, sure. And so she gets buzzed in and I'm standing there and I'm kind of taking in the whole situation. And it's, I feel like I'm in a, uh, I don't know, a law enforcement setting or something like that. It was really pretty cold and stark. But the one thing I thought was interesting is that they're, they're out in the county, they had Christmas cards for sale. And it was a fundraiser for this extraordinary non for profit effort to sort of care for people in very, very difficult circumstances. And so I was like, Christmas cards, well, that's interesting. So I picked up the Christmas cards, and on the cover of the Christmas card, there was an image which has burned itself in my brain and I will never forget. I sought to try and find uh, one of these cards somewhere. They might be in boxes I have in storage somewhere. But anyway, the card was of a couple in front of a trash can fire. Very stylized, not a picture, but like a, a, a painting. It was very clear. There was a trash can fire in the street and there was a clearly uh, meant to be uh, depicted as a person without housing couple holding a baby. <coughs> 
and a star in the, in the night sky. And you opened the card, and in the middle it said, there's still no room at the end. And I was like, oh my God, I love this card. Because it spoke a truth to me that I really didn't want to entertain, but I did it in such an elegant and beautiful way. And I, I don't think I've had a Christmas season since then. I've not thought about that card or at some point told the story of finding that card. And it's, it's caused me to try to remember as I have eggnog or, you know, like, no, not Spike. But I mean, I, I enjoy a cookie and some virgin eggnog. The, 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 the hardships that other people are enduring that I don't. And I mean, I've had really my own miseries and plenty of things to complain about and really, really tough passages in the holiday, but never has it been the case that I've had a holiday where I could say I am suffering the worst of any person on the planet. And yet, I feel like often, sometimes when we are in the midst of our own suffering, we, our own suffering seems highly magnified. I mean, we become sort of really distressed and it's like, oh, everybody's got to know. I'm like hurting over here. Hey! And Wow, that's a really hard thing to do when we had 300,000 dead from COVID and we have uh, the thousands and thousands who died from opioid overdose and the many Karen alumni who have committed suicide and, uh, you know, the climatological devastations that have just taken. This is, a, this is a time when, if you're paying attention, your own suffering must add its voice to a chorus of human suffering. And that's kind of the best we get. So, my favorite theorist about dealing with loss is a fellow named Phil Rich. And Phil Rich says that with respect to previous models of how grief works or whatever, the, the deficit of many charted paths through grief is that they orient themselves towards the outcome, which is some sort of acceptance or resolution, like, yay! And, and Phil Rich is like, you never get to get to a feeling of like wholeness and completeness without a messy middle. Grief, grief requires its due diligence. Grief requires its necessary suffering. Um, one of the most profound moments of that that I saw was um, just a little over three years ago when my brother Steve was dying. I was with Steve's wife, my sister-in-law, and uh, we were in this ICU. He had been um, in a tragic motorcycle accident. The deer ran in front of him, and uh, he was motorcycling with three AA buddies. Because um, he was sober, and uh, it was just like a terrible interruption in his life. He had a major brain injury, but was on a ventilator. Uh, had all this orthopedic surgeries. They were trying to decide what we were going to do. In a few days, we would disconnect life support, and eventually he would just um, drift away. But anyway, this one moment, there was a chaplain who had come in. Of course, I'm, I'm like a chef in the restaurant, so I'm, I'm really critical of other chaplains. But anyway, there's a chaplain who comes in, completely was the clumsiest chaplain I've ever seen, especially when he found out I was a chaplain. He was like almost backpedaling out of the room. But, but he did a terrible job of like trying to fix my sister-in-law in a way that made me really angry. And shortly thereafter, the neurosurgeon came in and showed us the brain scans and was explaining what this uh, diffuse axonal injury diagnosis was. And, and basically telling my sister-in-law, like, this is really not going to get better. It does not appear to be going to be getting by the moment worse. And, and my, the doc leaves, he was great. The, now it's just me, my, my brother who's, who's there in the room but not responding, and, and my sister-in-law. And she collapsed into one of these pseudo-recliners in hospital room chairs. And, and it starts becoming almost catatonic, like curling up like a baby in a ball. And she's heaving and sobbing. And uh, 
I, I, I mean, I'm trained professional, and so like all that kicks in for me in a moment. Like, what do I do? And I have this extraordinary impulse to just go and put my hand like on her shoulder and maybe say things like, "I love you," and "I'm here," and and I'm doing those things which I'm sure to do. We just don't explain, don't try to make it better. Just like ride the misery pony, because this woman, poor woman, needs to feel this unacceptable, miserable truth. And all of a sudden, there had been a uh, ICU nurse, ah, oh, gosh, it's going to kill me, I can't remember her first name, Allison. So Allison had been caring for us as a family, and, and uh, all of a sudden, this weird sense of accompaniment, as if I was not alone there. But what had happened is Allison had come in, into the room behind me, and she had kneeled and sort of put her presence right around me. She had not really touched me, but she might as well have had her hand on my shoulder, and I had my hand on my sister-in-law's shoulder. And she like joined the moment. And I, I wrote her a letter after this whole thing went down about how she was my chaplain and our chaplain, even more than the chaplain was. Because she did not come in and try and fix it. She didn't come in and try and make it better. She didn't come in and like pedal back out because she was afraid of the spirituality that was already there in the family. She just joined in the middle of the pool. And interestingly, the day we disconnected the life support from my brother was a Sunday. She was supposed to be off. And all of a sudden, I turned around and there she was. This poor, unboundary ICU nurse comes in on her day off to be with this family that she had met with in tragedy. God bless that woman. So, if we take some lessons from Phil Rich and Allison, and from the Alcoholics Anonymous model, or from the Buddhist approach to human suffering, and just listen to wisdom, what it says is that there's no hop, skip, jump to follow up. Like there's no there's no easy way to go from misery to you know and, and of course many of us thought that's what Aaron would do. And so but we're cheating ourselves of the desperate need we have to feel the reality of our pain. And if you look at the four through nine chunk, the middle passage of the A twelve steps, they include an unpacking first of all of who I feel harmed me. And then, ultimately, an honest look at how my behavior has affected others. That's not because I intentionally harmed other people. I really didn't. I'm sort of trying to be a nice guy. But I had to look in my recovery journey at how painful it was for people to hear me say, it's my weekend, it's my money. It's like, I, I'm not on the job, I'm not hurting anybody. You know, like, those kind of, which came across, shockingly, as very self-centered. I was really, really, my behavior as an addict was terribly self-centered and hurtful to other people. Don't raise your hands. I know, I know you're all different than I was. But, but it's only in an honest engagement with the reality of the harm that I can find an authentic passage through to some kind of sense of greater wholeness. And the truth about these things is, post-COVID, people keep talking about going back to normal. But I will tell you my wisdom from 20 years of chaplaincy and 30 years of sobriety is going back language is unhealthy. Because that's, that means we didn't learn anything from what we've been through. So I don't need to get back to some previous day. I, I, will, I will never view hand hygiene in the same way. I can assure you that. And I hope you won't either, right? So even if we get to the point where we don't all have to mask and be super cautious, I guarantee you I will be washing my hands more for the rest of the days that God gives me. And so tomorrow is the winter solstice. Early in the morning is the moment after logically, astronomically, astronomically, where the um, turn happens in the orbit of the Earth and the Sun, and we we find the shortest daylight passage in tomorrow's daylight window. Very similar to today's, but the changes are short at the outswing. So very gradually, little by slowly, 
days will begin to lengthen in that. But, interestingly, in the wisdom of wisdom traditions, this is the beginning of winter. Right? It's when we mark the beginning of winter is the shortest day of the year. So you know, I think winter lit. Well, the good news is winter begins on the shortest, like on the lowest point. But it's going to stay cold, it's going to stay dark, it's going to gradually sort of inch our way out. And I would say the same thing to you in terms of your addiction recovery. You might think that your discharge date, whether it's Wednesday, like a fellow I know is right here in the room, or, or, or we have, we've begged you to stay for the holidays, and you're staying for the holidays, and you're jumping on January 2nd or 3rd. God bless you for making the decision to stay. It's a wise one, and I support you 100% in doing that, because going home for the holidays can be a very, very dangerous decision in any year, but especially in pandemic circumstances. Or if it's three weeks or whatever, whatever but people think, oh, I'm like, I'm out of treatment, Barry! That is only the beginning of a slow crawl towards a new, a new reality, which we hope is informed by the suffering of the present, and in which the thing that I take as the most important of all the stories I've told today is Allison and myself with my sister-in-law, the power of love, like to accompany one another in the darkness. And to lovingly distance ourselves from one another. That's a really tough message that I've learned this year. Is to say, no, we're not going to have my wife's mom with us for Christmas because she's 84. And, like, in, for the sake of her protection. You know, those kinds of, those kinds of decisions are really, really tough. But made out of, um, out of this hope that, that I hold that there are better days ahead. I deeply believe and, and, and the cyclical nature of, of the cosmos and reality teaches me how the, the sun will come up tomorrow and I don't mean to be Pollyanna or trivial about it suddenly but I, I just really believe spring is coming and vaccines are on their way and uh, it's not, it's not going to be an immediate sort of like yay but uh, there are many things that are changing in the global dynamics that I am guardedly allowing myself to be a teeny bit optimistic about. And I hope you will join me in that. And find hope for yourselves in your emergent recovery. Because I never thought I could stay sober for a day or a week, but one day at a time, I haven't had a drink in almost 32 years. And um, so I offer you that as a weird fact, but also as a dangling possibility for you, that you could and enter the journey, even if they're a relaxation, you try this multiple times, that's all teaching, right? That's all learn from the past and integrate in a decision that you make in the present. So let's do the last day before winter and the first day of winter and the second day of winter and the third day of winter as best we can. Let's do it as charitably with one another. And when you see one another in a time and place of suffering, please don't fix just a company. Right? If, if one of your peers is suddenly bleeding or you go to consequences group or whatever, it may not be the time to tell them exactly what they did wrong or exactly how they should fix it or how they should understand it or whatever. Nor is it terribly helpful for you to suddenly jump on the other side of, yeah, you know, the law enforcement people are horrible or whatever. Like, all of that is way too cerebral when the deep needs of our heart are to just be heard and be loved. So I offer that to you on our December 20th through Christmas. Observance on the fourth Sunday of Advent, and I pray.